Good morning and welcome everybody to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Health Press. In this broadcast series, we talk once a week about all type of globally relevant infectious diseases. I am Joe Schmidt and with me is Dr. Melvin Sanikas. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you're watching Global Healthcast. We're very thrilled that we got an increasing number of people watching us, and our Global Healthcast 3 even had more than 4,000 clicks, so we hope we will continue like this. And as always, we start with COVID. So, Melvin, what is new on the EPI side with COVID? Well, this is from the WHO COVID-19 situation report released a few days ago. Um, as you can see, the number of weekly cases increased for the fourth consecutive week after a declining trend since the last peak in March this year. During the week of uh, June 27th to the 3rd of July, um, which was basically last week, over 4.6 million cases were reported. And this is similar to that of the previous week, but more in the thousands and the number of weekly deaths declined by almost 12 percent as compared to the previous week so just looking at this we can probably say that yes the cases are increasing but it's good that the number of deaths are decreasing but then again as we mentioned in the previous global health cast we said that normally deaths happen two to three weeks after the cases so it's something to um, to see what the trend will be in the next few weeks, I guess. Any prediction? What, what would you predict to happen when we meet next week? Well, it would really depend on several factors, right? First, the coverage of booster doses, basically in, in the countries that are experiencing the increased number of cases. And also it has something to do with the healthcare system as well, right, of, of those countries. So. It's anybody's guess, basically. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, the predictions are very difficult, particularly if they are predictions on the future, right? <laughs> so, yeah, what can we say? But I guess cases will go up, deaths will continue to go down, and I would expect that deaths will go up only in two, three weeks. But let's see what happens, and we'll come back on that one. Very good. Melvin, here is your next challenge. How do you interpret this and what do we see here on the screen? Yeah, um, I, I chose this because this is really showing the weekly new hospital admissions for COVID-19 per million people. And this is incidence. This is from our world in data and it's showing that in many countries worldwide. So I randomly shows the countries that are experiencing increased number of cases. The number of hospitalized cases are also increasing, not as much as the previous waves, but nevertheless increasing. And the latest Omicron subvariants behind the, the new COVID surges in these countries really have an enhanced ability to escape immunity conferred by vaccine doses and even antibody therapies. So we now know that BA 2.12.1, BA.4, BA.5, they make up more than 70% of cases in, in the US, for example. And together, these three subvariants make up around 90% of cases globally, and they are highly transmissible. Um, as I've said, they're evasive because of mutations in the spike proteins. And I guess the other thing to say is, um, if you compare this to the, the previous slide, we can conclude that these variants appear to cause more COVID infections among people in general, but the immunity from vaccines and immunity from previous infection seem to help still. That is probably why these numbers are not as bad as the previous waves. Hmm. Or look at Singapore, how this is going up here. Uh, what is the difference, Singapore and other countries? Is it a delay in the other countries? Will this come back in Germany and we will have skyrocketing numbers on hospitalization? Some people over here warn about this already. Well, it, it may be like that, but so the one thing I know about Singapore, it's one of the most fully vaccinated countries in the world, right? When I say fully, it's the two doses. But in terms of um, boosters, they're actually lagging behind. So in, in terms of 
the first two doses, Singapore's vaccination coverage is over 90%, but for booster, it's just half of that or even less. And for me, I guess the message is, if you're living in Singapore and if you haven't received your booster dose, uh, it's time to get it now. Yeah. Actually, that is true for everybody. And as I'm 60 plus, and I don't want to give you the details here, no, uh, I got my fourth dose. And the one question, uh, and we can discuss this at a later point, vaccination strategies. Uh, the question is, when should I get my fifth dose? Now, or should I wait until September, October? Or, uh, but, but this may be too early to discuss, right? Right now, I just got those four. Yeah, this professor, I think this is the next up, next, a good topic for the next uh, global health yeah. cast. So maybe we can talk about: Do we need to get um, a a booster dose with a different formulation of the vaccine, uh, yeah. with a the ancestral strain plus Omicron or ancestral strain yeah. plus whatever else that can be added to the vaccine? Great, Melvin. Thank you very much. This is great insights, and I think these hospitalizations rate I trust more than the uh, than the pure case numbers that you had in the previous slide. So uh, this one is really, I don't know, um, whatever they test, but this one is rock solid rock data, right? This is something you cannot, you don't go to a hospital if you want to go to a party, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you go to the hospital, there is a clear endpoint. Very mm -hmm. good. Melvin, you have one more information on COVID. And wh what is that we see here? Well, you know, I, I really chose this one because um, I always get questions from people. You know, I'm vaccinated. I got um, COVID. I'm vaccinated. I tested positive, but I was okay. I'm not vaccinated, but I'm feeling better. So, you know, all these different scenarios, I think, can be sort of explained by this wonderful image. This is from the Financial Times. So we know that immune responses are shaped by many factors and in no particular order, they are the following, our immune system, um, how well our immune system functions, the specific infection that um, you, you got, so the variant you got infected with, whether it's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or omicron, and of course the COVID vaccination you got, whether you got vaccinated or not, and also the booster or number of booster doses that you have received. So if you think about all these different factors, um, there can be several different outcomes. And you can also add the fact that infection in, in the past with other non-pandemic coronaviruses, so I'm talking about the OC43, HKU1, um, normal coronaviruses, they also affect the kind of immune response that you will get. So basically our first encounter with a spike antigen, either through infection or vaccination, they shape our subsequent pattern of immunity through something we call immune imprinting. So I think this is just good to show people that our immune response to COVID is not the same because of many, many factors, including our own immune system, the infection we got or the vaccine that we got or the booster that we got. And th these are many different factors that affect whatever happens to immune response. This is interesting because think you want to do a study with a new vaccine or with an old vaccine to show if it is working. And um, you, you, who will enter into the study? Do you want to sort out everybody who was never vaccinated? There won't be many people left, right? Mm -hmm. But everybody will have had, you know, one one bout of disease at that time, right? If you start uh, next week, you you will be infected or you have the vaccine. Basically, there will be few uh, COVID naive people, but it's so diverse. How do you want to study the efficacy? Then it will be very very difficult to find uh, a clear subset of patients who go into the study. And the results may differ from country to country based on the vaccines and on the variants that were circulating. So this is really a challenge now. Yeah, and, and like what you said, um, if you are creating a COVID vaccine now, it's it would be very difficult to find someone who's not been vaccinated or who hasn't been infected by any of these variants of, of COVID. So I guess these newer vaccines should really take into consideration the fact that the people that you will be including in the study will 
have some form of immunity to COVID. And it's also difficult to show that the vaccine you will be giving them will really show an improvement in terms of immune response. So that's the tricky part, I would, I would say. Yeah. This is getting very difficult and very cumbersome. And let's see if we can come up with a vaccination strategy next Friday. David, I also have some interesting information today, which is not on infectious diseases. It is short, and I hope you like it. This is what you see here, Bavarian meatloaf, a German word is Leberkäse, liver cheese. And it is usually not much liver and not much cheese in there, but it's basically meat. And uh, I tell you the story that there are these machines out there called bioresonance machine. And basically the assumption is that all humans have some oscillations, individual oscillations, and that there are machines who can pick up these oscillations and they can tell what's wrong with the patient and they can even be used as therapy. So you take the electrodes of the machine, the machine finds, what's, finds out what's wrong with you, and then the machine sends back the right oscillations so that you become healthy again. That is the theory. As a medical doctor and when I was a student and I, when I was teaching at universities, I've never heard of these oscillations. So it is a, uh, let me say, very courageous hypothesis. Let me put it this way. In the end, these devices come at four to 5,000 euros. And the claim is they measure the body oscillations and they predict health risks. And two of these machines were bought by my colleague Walter Dorsch in Munich. And he used them on nine healthy volunteers, two very sick patients, then he used one Bavarian meatloaf, that is why I showed you this picture, one dead body and one wet towel. And he did repeated measurements on all of these subjects or things, right? It's a thing or patient humans or things, right? Now, what he found is in the two patients, the severe medical disease was missed. The dead body was found to be in best health, but had some disease risk. I mean, mentioned these were dead bodies, right? Mm -hmm. The measurements on the wet towel and the Bavarian meatloaf resulted in hugely variable results if you change the input parameters, age, gender, weight, and that cannot be. There was a sometimes 200% difference depending on the input parameters. If there are oscillations, they should be the same all the time. They cannot change by 200%. Similar results were found for the sick patients and for the volunteers. This item, these machines, or, you know, I don't know the details of the story, but in the end, this went to court. And the court decision was, to make a long story short, the managing directors went to prison for two and three years, respectively, because of fraud. They had to pay a 2.5 million penalty. And the conclusion of the court was, it is proven that they sold useless machines. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this because watch out, these machines are still sold in the internet, for example, on eBay, and I checked yesterday, so they are still out there. Um, so don't buy them, right? It's useless. And there are even courses where you can learn the method and they are offered to therapists. Look, I'm a medical doctor. There are people who are biologists, immunologists, virologists, whatever. But a therapist does not exist. Everybody can be a therapist. You can be a therapist even if you have nothing in mind with medicine in all your professional life. You can be a therapist by taking this course and using the machine and you make big money. And you use like 10 subjects and you, you find their oscillations and read them. And then you make a lot of money and the investment is back in your pocket, right? Basically, this is fraud and that's the story. But what I really, what drives me is the question, what is truth? In religion is, truth is what the scriptures say. In politics, in an autocratic system, truth is what Caesar says. The one on top tells you this is the truth. In democracy, the truth is what the majority wants. They don't call it truth, but it's the wish of the majority and that's the decision. In medicine in the old days, we had truth is what the expert says. We call it eminence-based medicine. 
then today we have evidence-based medicine. You need the data. You need to show the data and you need to tell the method. How did you come up with the data? And then you have to show that you can repeatedly come to the same data, but that your data is confirmed by other data, and that is called evidence-based and scientific validity. That is evidence-based medicine. And in alternative medicine and homeopathy, I guess the truth is what the expert wants to sell. They sell anything if they make money with it, like with these machines. And that brings me to my cartoon of this week and alternative cooking would be in a picture like this. You won't get much nice things to eat if you use alternative cooking. In conclusion, medicine does not always provide the right answers, but alternative answers are clearly wrong very frequently. Melvin, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I think this is a really nice picture to just illustrate to people that you know, medicine has been studied for decades, centuries, and systematically studied. And these alternative medicine, shall we even call them medicine? Alternative ways, I guess, they have not been studied systematically, but people still believe them. And it's just, for me, looking at this slide now, it's, it's, it's funny because in the past, right, it's really the eminence-based medicine where the old learned experts are considered really the Bible, what they say is reality. And then you have the evidence-based medicine where you have to show the data before people can believe you. And now with social media, the internet, YouTube, all these things, it's eloquence-based medicine where people who have the most followers, people who are presenting the most outrageous stories, people who are getting more clicks and likes and shares, they are now basically saying the truth. So yeah. I, I think it's it's a weird evolution, but it is what's happening. Yeah, so instead of evidence, we have clicks, high clicks and high like, how a high number of likes is the truth, right? And that's not the way it works. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. This was our Global Healthcast on July. I guess today is the 8th, if I'm correct, 2022. Please like, share, and leave your comments below. Thanks for joining us today. I am Joe Schmidt. And I'm Melvin Sanikas. Thank you very much, everyone. Be safe and be sure to read only the right information and beware of alternative information out there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.